biodiversity is the living fabric of this planet. And of course, we need to conserve it. We need it because we are human beings. We need it because we are part of an ecosystem. But the thing is, biodiversity, most of what it provides, ecosystems, species, and genes, most of what they provide is free. It's what we call public goods and services, clean air, fresh water, nutrients that flow from the forest to the fields of poor farmers, you know, the pollination of bees. These are not price services. And unfortunately, in today's world, economics has become the currency of policy. So unless you attach values to something, it's not valued. And this is the challenge. How do you convince policymakers to conserve biodiversity unless you explain it to them in economic terms? Because all they understand is economically informed trade-off choices. Firstly, there is intrinsic value in nature because without nature we would not exist and no species would exist. Secondly, there are some values that we can capture and that we can demonstrate. Um, and we know that if uh, many calculations have been done to show that if we were to lose ecosystem services, that would be trillions of dollars of value that we don't receive anymore. In, uh, and that, that would be a huge cost to the economy and to society. Specific things that relate to agriculture, for example, the pollination provided by insects, mainly bees. And calculations have been done which show that the global value of pollination by insects is about 150 million euros. That's about $220 million. And um, that is significant because of two reasons. One is that it's provided free, so we don't account for it. And therefore, when, as a result of the use of pesticides and as a result of pollution and climate change, we lose pollinators, we don't realize what we are losing until we start seeing the decline in the value of fruit and, and nuts and, and also you know, crops like cocoa and coffee, which are, which are pollinated by bees. And that's actually how we calculate the value of pollination. To give you a sense, secondly, of why it's important, 150 billion euros is actually something like 9.5% of the total agricultural output, global agricultural output. The total output is about $2.3 trillion. We are talking about a number of about $200 billion. So that's almost one-tenth of the total output. That's huge. And missing that is a huge cost. As you know, nowadays, the private sector is two-thirds of the economy and jobs. Unfortunately, the free values of nature have become a free lunch for them. So they firstly use them because they're valuable. They lose them because they're free. And the same with countries as well. National accounts, like GDP accounts as we call them, they simply do not capture these values because they are not priced by any market. And because in our foolishness, we tend to equate price and value. Price is what you pay. Value is what you receive. You can receive value even if you don't pay a price. In fact, nature doesn't charge anything. When did a bee send you an invoice? Right? So that's the whole point, that you have to account for these values at the private sector level in your profits and at the government level in your GDP. None of that happens right now, which is why we are enjoying a free lunch. But like any free lunch, it does not last. Today, 525 million small farms around this world occupy something like 60% of the arable land. They produce half the food that's grown. 400 million of those are less than two hectares. That's tiny. That's basically the poor people. There's about a billion subsistence and poor farmers who grow food for themselves and for the local market. Unless we can improve the yields in those small farms and do it in a way that is sustainable, they are not going to get richer and food will not be enough. So by focusing on the yield in small farms and doing it in a sustainable manner, and there are many ways of doing it, including allowing crop mixtures, allowing the use of seeds freely, as against charging them huge um, prices for selling them genetically modified seeds and encouraging them to rotate crop species to use different strains of the same of the same crop and to use farmyard manure instead of expensive uh, chemical fertilizers and to try and capture water on the farm reusing farm water these are common sense practices which we need to encourage the smallholder to do and if we do that several studies including one by the FAO have shown that Increases in yield are on not only possible, they are observed. 
we're talking about increases of 80% across a massive population of several million farms in 57 developing countries. An FAO study showed an increase of 180%. In my country, in India, a system of rice intensification that was used recently produced the record yield of 22.4 tons per hectare of wet rice in a state called Bihar. These are all possible, they are actual, they are real results, they are success. But they are not driven by the top six seed companies and fertilizer companies who hold the entire discourse in the space of agriculture. We have to get out with this reality. We have to place it on the table and ensure that policymakers understand that what is in the interest of the people is not to promote the profit motives of corporations, but rather the public interest of the poor smallholder farmer. One billion of them, we don't have alternative jobs for them. We cannot replace them with intensive farming. We can only improve their livelihoods and give them better health, better education, and better opportunities. That's the way forward. That will solve two problems, hunger, poverty.